We want to once again welcome our visitors. We're, <clears throat> we're glad that you're with us tonight. And we hope that you'll stay after our services so that we can visit with you a, a little bit longer. We are looking at Romans chapter 7 tonight. The book of Romans is an amazing book. It's a book in which we find justification through obedient faith. The theme of the book is set forth in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, where Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to all those who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So we see in Romans uh, the, this book, this epistle written by the Apostle Paul, that Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is emphasizing the fact that we can be justified, we can be reconciled through faith in Jesus Christ. And we see from chapter 1 through chapter 16, through the entire book, that this faith that's being spoken of is an obedient faith. It obeys the will of God. And therefore, through obedient faith, a person is made right because God has provided a plan. A plan of redemption, a scheme by which we can be brought back to Him. And He has done this out of His grace, mercy, love, and compassion for mankind. In Romans chapter 7, it's made very clear in the very first part of the verse that we are not under the law of Moses. And he's making that very clear in the first few verses of chapter 7. The concept of law, we talked about this morning as we talked about the law of Moses and how that it was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And we did cite this verse this morning, uh, Romans chapter 7 and verse 7. And what we find here in uh, Romans 7, verses 7 through 12, is the reality of sin. The reality of sin, verses 7 through 12. Paul says, what should we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. You shall not covet. So we see here it was the law that revealed what sin is. It defines bad behavior. It lets us know what wrong is. And therefore, sin being a transgression or the breaking of a law or being lawlessness, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, when a person violates that, they become lawless or unlawful in the eyes of God. Now look at verse 8. As we're talking in verses 7 through 12 of Romans chapter 7 about the reality of sin. He says in verse 8, But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire, for apart from the law, sin was dead. Without law, there is no sin. And he says, the sin taking opportunity. Taking opportunity to have a person have these desires to do what is wrong caused a, a chain reaction within Paul and true for every human being when they face these desires, these lusts within them. Notice what he says in verse 9. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy, the commandment holy, just, and good. Now here's the point. Paul is saying, as he answers the question, what shall we say then, is the law sin? Absolutely not. The law is holy, the commandment holy, just, and good. Verse 12. There's nothing wrong, there's nothing amiss with God's law. The problem is with humans. God who is perfect, God who is absolutely righteous, God who is perfectly just, 
He gives us a law for our own good. And that law, whether it be referring to the law of Moses, of course we know it is in context, there in verse uh, 7, you shall not covet, that's part of the Ten Commandments. Or whether it be talking about the New Testament law that we are under today that we will talk about a little bit later on in our lesson. It is good. It is perfect. It is for our benefit. It is for our own good to obey it. However, that temptation comes around. In verse 8, taking opportunity by the commandment, producing in me all manner of evil desire, that yearning to disobey. Now notice what he says there in verse 10. As we look at the reality of sin, verses 7 through 12. Notice what he says in verse 9. I was once alive without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Paul is saying here in verse 9 that there was at one time that he was alive and then he died. Well, actually, this is not talking about physical death. Certainly not. If Paul was physically dead, he would not be writing this letter to the Romans. He's talking about spiritually, he was once alive without the law. Now, if Paul was born and reared and lived up until his conversion under the law of Moses, at what time was Paul ever without the law? The time in which he was innocent. He's saying here that he was without the law when he was in his infancy, when he was in his early childhood. He was without the law in his life personally. It's not that the law didn't exist. It meant that he personally did not have any relationship with the law because, as we would say, he was not accountable. He did not understand right and wrong. He did not have the mental ability to discern good and evil. And therefore, Paul is saying, I was once alive without the law. He was innocent. Innocent. This is one of the many verses that proves we're not born sinful. We're born innocent. And so Paul is saying here that he was once without the law, but the commandment came. How did it come? It came to Paul. Paul realized it. Paul understood it. He understood the commandment. He understood right from wrong. He became accountable. He violated the will of God, sin revived, and I died. In other words, he became separated from God by his own sin. Is that not exactly what you find in Adam and Eve? In the Garden of Eden, they were perfect. They were created in the image of God. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. They were perfect. They had no flaws. They had everything given to them. And... Satan comes along and says in the Garden of Eden, No, there's something that you need. You need this tree of the knowledge of good and evil that God is saying you're not supposed to partake of. But he, because He knows in the day that you do that, you'll become as gods, knowing good and evil. <clears throat> that produced desire within Eve and desire within Adam. That produced a desire to disobey God's will. Adam and Eve did disobey God's will, and that very day they died spiritually. How do I know that? Because they were cut off from God. They were removed from the Garden of Eden. They were not able to partake of the tree of life anymore. A curse was placed upon the earth, and then the scheme of redemption was put into play. Genesis 3 and verse 15, the first prophecy about the coming of the Messiah. And so we see here that this scenario repeats in every human's life when that human reaches that age of accountability. Sin becomes a reality in our own life. We were once, de or we were once alive uh, without the commandment, without the law in our life. But when temptation came, the commandment came to us. We realized what that commandment was. We realized God's will. We became accountable. Sin revived and then we died spiritually. Ezekiel 18 and verse 20. The soul that sins, it shall die. Romans 6 <clears throat> verse 23. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
So we see the reality of sin here in verses 7 through 12. He says in verse 11, For sin, taking the occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. The problem is not with the law. The problem is with sin and temptation using that which God gave to kill people every single day. To kill people, spiritually speaking, to separate them from God. Because we know that's exactly what sin does. Iniquity does. Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. Sin separates us from God. So in Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 12, we see the reality of sin. Then in verses 13 through 23, we see the repetition of sin. The repetition of sin. Look at this struggle that's inside of a person that Paul is facing. Now, some have said that verses 13 through 23 is talking about Paul before his conversion. And there is pretty good evidence to, to, to that effect. Others say that this is talking about Paul's struggle with sin uh, as a Christian, as a saved individual. Well, be that as it may, we're going to all reach to the same conclusion and the same remedy for sin at the end of the chapter. But I, I, can't, help but not, I can't help but to see myself in verses 13 through 23. The struggle with sin within us. Look at this and and put yourself in Paul's position. The repetition of sin, verses 13 through 23. Has then then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will to do, I agree that the law, that it is good. With the law, that it is good. Verse 17. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me there is, that is in my flesh... Nothing good dwells for to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. Verse 19. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Verse 20. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me and the one who wills to do good. Verse 22, I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. Verse 23, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. I don't know about you, but I see myself in that. In that struggle against sin. In that civil war, as it were, within us. As we, we want to do what's right, but we see, we see that we fail so many times. And we have to go to God in, in forgiveness and, and ask Him. We have to always reevaluate ourselves in, in light of what God's will is in the New Testament. And therefore, we, we know what is good. We know what we should be doing. We know what we should be active in. But then we find ourselves doing that which is wrong. What did Jesus say to his apostles who uh, were in the Garden of Gethsemane with him? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. There's that struggle within us. The spirit is willing. Yes, we want to serve God. We want to be godly. We, we want to be closer to God. We want to do what's right, but the flesh is so weak and struggles against the sin. Now, the reason why that's a problem is because, symbolically speaking, we open Pandora's box in our own life. When we committed our very first sin, we opened the door for more sin to be poured into our life. More temptation, more desire to do what's evil. This is a desire we placed upon ourselves 
when we initially violated the will of God. And therefore, we see this struggle. And as I said before, whether verses 13 through 23 is referring to Paul before his conversion, or whether it's talking about Paul in his present condition, fighting against the flesh, the, the repetition of sin is still a reality in any situation. Do we not find ourselves committing some of the same sins over and over and over again? You see, the devil knows how to tempt us. He knows what our weaknesses are. And therefore, he will uh, come at us with those weaknesses, at at our weaknesses. And he will tempt us. And we find ourselves failing the test because of the repetition of sin. But verses 24 and 25, we see the remedy for sin. The remedy for sin. As Paul concludes, and as we all could say, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Who's going to deliver us from sin in this this body of death? I thank God, verse 25, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So if I'm going to live in the flesh, I'm going to serve sin. It's a sinful activity if I just do whatever I want to do. If I live just according to my own desires, if I pander to my lust, it is living in the flesh and it's the law of sin. But with my mind, I have to say, I am going to live according to the will of God. So with my mind, I serve the law of God. Jesus Christ our Lord is the remedy for this sin problem. And so that's why you see Paul's outcry in verse 24. This is my deplorable condition. I am a wretched individual. I cannot solve my sin problem. Perhaps you have certain sins in your life that you're struggling with. We all do. The remedy is Christ. Oh, wretched men that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I cannot do it. The law of Moses couldn't do it. Because the law of Moses, as we've seen in chapter 7, identifies sin. Here's what sin is. Here's what sin will do. And if you violate the commandment of God, you're going to die spiritually. Well, then who will save me from this body of death? Only the Son of God. I thank God, Paul says in verse 25. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now notice you see this remedy to to sin in verses 24 and 25. But do you notice the word Jesus Christ, our Lord? That means I have to submit to His will. He's Lord. He's Master. Is that not exactly what you find Peter saying in Acts 2? And verse 36, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that this Jesus whom you crucified is both Lord and Christ. We must not only believe in Him, but we must accept that He is ruler, that He is Lord, and we must submit to His will. When we do that, then we have the remedy for our sin problem. That brings us into chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. Chapter 8, verse 1 and 2 of Romans. Here's the conclusion of all this. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That's why it's important for us as we study these passages to study the flow of the thought and sometimes the chapter and verse divisions can break up that flow of thought. And we have to see. Therefore, harkens back to what he was saying before in chapter 7. Jesus Christ, our Lord, He is the remedy for our sin. 
And with our mind, we will serve the law of God. But with the flesh, you'll serve the law of sin. And we know the law of sin brings about death. Verse 2 of Romans chapter 8. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus makes us free from the law of sin and death. And therefore, if we wish to be freed, as Paul cried out, Who will deliver me from this body of death? We have to go to Christ. We have to look to Him to be our Savior. We have to look to Him to be our example. We have to look to His teachings as they are found in the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> and as we look to that and we believe when we obey and we don't walk according to the flesh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, but according to the Holy Spirit as that's revealed in the New Testament, then there is now no condemnation. That means, as the key word you find throughout Romans, that means justified, acquitted. We can be set free from our sins, the sin problem that we placed ourselves in when we first sinned, and the struggle that we struggle with each and every day. As I said before, as we looked at verses 13 through 23 of Romans chapter 7, whether this is referring to Paul before his conversion or his daily battle with sin, that civil war within him, each and every day, the remedy is still the same. Jesus Christ our Lord. We can have peace of mind. We seek and we find. We have that abundant forgiveness, that, that peace that God will forgive us as long as we remain faithful to Him. The question tonight is this. Do you have the reality of sin in your life? If you're accountable to God, you do. All of us do. We have the reality of sin in our life. Do you face the repetition of sin in your life? Well, we all do. We struggle with it every single day. Have you come to the remedy for that in Jesus Christ? That you believe in Him and you're willing to submit to Him as Lord. As those on the day of Pentecost who said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? In Acts 2 and verse 37, And Peter said in Acts 2, 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you need to obey God's command to be baptized, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which is the gospel, God's power to save, then we have water available. If you confess your faith and repent of your sins, we'll immerse you into Christ tonight and you can be set free. If you have done that but you're in sin, you're living in the flesh as a child of God, you have put yourself back into bondage. Repent and come back to the Lord. As always, the choice is yours while we stand and sing.